if you go into an organization that uses profit accounting as its guideposts and North Star, you essentially have an organization who has embraced profits as purpose. That means it's okay to abuse your customers and abuse your employees as long as it uh, generates profits. That, of course, is ridiculous. The companies who have grown to be market leaders, they've had the highest net promoter score in every industry we've looked at so far. So the guys who are winning in business are not winning by playing that abusive game. They are loving customers. Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. Today, I'm speaking with Fred Reicheld. Fred's the mind behind the customer loyalty movement, and he's the creator of the Net Promoter Score, which is most commonly known as NPS. Thousands of businesses have used NPS over the years to measure customer experience, including household names like Apple and Netflix and Disney. And it's so ubiquitous, honestly, that I just assumed that it always existed. But no, it was invented, and the inventor was Fred Reicheld. That makes him one of the great minds of management theory to come out of the last decades. Even though so many companies use NPS, Fred says the vast majority are using it wrong because it goes a lot deeper than the simple metric. The deeper idea is this. What emotional state should we strive for in each part of the business? Organizations that use the metric without that deeper understanding not only lose opportunities to build long-lasting customer and employee relationships, they may even do harm to them. Fred's a Harvard-trained author and a Bain Fellow who has spent most of his career restructuring businesses to put customers at the center of organizational purpose. His most recent book, Winning on Purpose, is the culmination of those years of experience. And it's the clearest and deepest explanation to date on why and how to accelerate company success by inspiring teams to love their customers. Fred and I talk about changing how we measure companies to focus on long-term value instead of simply extracting value in the form of short-term profit. We also talk about how we can use NPS to gain meaningful customer feedback and use that feedback to affect large-scale change within a company. Our conversation covers how customer loyalty is created and how it's maintained and how to track repeat customers through a concept called earned growth rate. And of course, we talk about where employees fit into this model and how we can use Fred's approach to deliver a better experience of work. Okay, if you enjoy this episode, be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Your ratings and subscriptions are what have raised Work for Humans into the top 50 podcasts in the United States in business and management, and we couldn't do that without you. And now, my conversation with Fred Reicheld. Fred Reicheld. Welcome to Work for Humans. Thank you. Nice to be here. I talk to a lot of writers, and I talk to a lot of thinkers in business. Almost to a person, they feel like their ideas have not reached as many people as they they wish they had. And you, on the other hand, invented the net promoter score. You really championed the concept of customer loyalty, and it's gone everywhere. It's gone so far. I've known about it for years, but I didn't know about you. And so it's taken on a life of its own and it's moved around and it's influenced a lot of businesses. So why another book? Yeah, I am. I've been thrilled that uh, these ideas around the importance of loyalty and using Net Promoter as a way of measuring progress have become almost uh, ubiquitous. The problem is most companies who are implementing Net Promoter really aren't they're getting it wrong. They're, they're only getting a tiny fraction of what I had in mind. And I, I think winning on purpose is my effort to get the loyalty movement back on track. Because I think most people have the right intentions. They're doing things that are inflicting grave damage to, the, to their goal of becoming more customer-centric. So winning on purpose is my manual to get, get things corrected and accelerate progress toward toward loving customers. When I was reading it, one of the things I saw is that people, you cited some companies that seem to be using the net promoter score without actually adopting the purpose. So what it looked like to me was that people got the idea of what a survey would look like, but they had somehow lost the soul 
of what it's really for. What's the mistake? I think they generally use the the logic that, gosh, Fred has a point here. We do need to help hold our teams accountable to treating customers right and and making them happy. And so we're just going to take this net promoter score, this, this cool invention, and link it to employee bonuses and make it a KPI for our organization. And I understand why that makes sense to them. If you're, you know, if you're serious about it in business, you hold people accountable to it. Problem is, it's based on a survey. And surveys, especially if they're self-administered, it's very difficult to know how that score links up to what your score used to be and, and comparing it to others. There are people who spend their entire careers on this idea in medicine, for instance, how important it is to get double blind and placebos. And there's a rigor, there is a rigorous way to use surveys to get real comparable data. But most companies don't appreciate that. So they just send out surveys and look at the responses. 2% response rate. Who knows what the other 98% of your customers are thinking if you're only hearing from a biased 2%. And I think people just sort of overlook that idea. And you also run into the things that, gosh, when I hold my people accountable and I rank them, order them, and pay bonuses to the, the top NPS performers, well, there's just a bias that creeps into the system where some employees are going to start begging for scores and others are going to say, hey, this system isn't perfect. There's all sorts of problems. You can't hold us accountable. And they're right, but, but then they stop learning from it. So, and I think most importantly, this is an inspirational idea. Our boss cares. They want to help us enrich the lives of our customers. That's something that should make me happy as an employee. But now they've turned it into just one more way to get into trouble. It's a metric, a score that I can look bad on. And I've been frustrated. I've coached people say, stop doing that. But they haven't because I think it is just such, you fall into the grooves that are already on the street. This is what we've done with everything else. And they don't recognize you can't do that with a survey-based score. Yeah, you know, after I read your book, I was at Office Depot. And on the way out, they said to me, look, we're really low on survey results, and it would be really great if you'd fill out our survey. And look, anything below 10 is bad. So if you can give us a 10, that would be great. And the truth is they'd given me great service. It was something that was being done to them. Yeah, I I hear that. I heard that from my car dealer. Yeah, I think employees and companies who make that mistake come to resent Net Promoter as a lousy system that doesn't really help them do a better job and it's flawed. And when they see their their colleagues begging for 10s or putting a sign on the office wall that says, remember, only a 10 is a passing grade at our company, this puts it in the bucket of this is a game, when in fact, it's meant to help people recognize the core purpose of a business is to enrich the customer's life. And if you can get feedback through a survey to learn how to do that better, that's wonderful. And if you can use that survey as evidence to your boss that this needs to be taken seriously, that's a great thing. But when the boss comes in and says, oh, the score is what I care about, it destroys the whole system. So I've used Net Promoter Score myself, and I haven't used it in the worst possible way, but I've used it incompletely. I know now after reading your book. And the most remarkable thing I think about this system is the words you use to describe businesses, which are businesses are about love and respect and loyalty and kindness. And essentially, you describe businesses as emotional relationships in ways that I've, I've really haven't seen. And to me, that's one of the most central errors of just using the net promoter score as like a score is that you've missed the heart of what it's really about. It is true. Businesses are human organizations and we tend to use financial fictions that accountants have come up with to control them and to guide them. And they, uh, that leads to some pretty serious uh, disconnects. Like what? If you go into an organization that uses profit accounting, 
financial accounting as its guideposts and North Star. And we use accounting numbers to measure progress and set bonuses and, and targets and budgets and governance. That's what we report to investors. You essentially have an organization who has embraced profits as purpose because that's what accounting solves for. It doesn't even do it very well in this day and age where the accounting fictions have drifted so far away from true cash flow. So any true investor is, is going to have to do some translation between accounting and EBITDA. But if you, can, if you presume EBITDA is your true purpose, that means it's okay to abuse your customers and abuse your employees as long as it uh, generates profits. And companies do that. And I think that's part of the reasons why financial capitalism has such a mixed reputation in, in the world today. They see companies doing abusive things that have nothing to do with loving and caring treatment of employees and customers. So part of my premise is that employees are customers. And we had a, a little bit of a conversation ahead of time, and you were very clear there's one customer and a company needs to be very focused on that customer. And so one of the things I noticed is that you talk about loving the customer, but when you talk about employees, you usually the word, use the word respect. I suspect that was conscious. Should companies love employees as much as customers? I think leaders should, yes. But the organization doesn't exist to love employees. It exists to love customers and enrich their lives. So I think uh, leaders who are, are living up to their duty, their job is, is to love their teams. And I think any parent who loves their children wants those adult children, you want them to succeed and have lives of meaning and purpose. Because in the end, a well-lived life has to have that outcome of uh, you've made the world a better place. And the way that you make the world a better place in a corporate organization is to enrich the lives of customers. That's the purpose. If you start thinking, oh, well, I'm a leader and my customers are my employees, then my job is to make them happy. And I don't want them to have to struggle and innovate and be held accountable to, to uncomfortable levels of excellence. And it's okay to spoil them. And uh, it's not. I think the only way that you can really watch out for the best interests of your employees is to make sure they embrace this inspiring mission of enriching the lives they touch and then help them achieve that. And make sure that they are earning from their colleagues the respect and recognition of playing a valued role in helping the team win with customers. Maybe these are subtle differences, but I think it's pretty important. And a lot of leaders today will say, oh, I have lots of stakeholders, my communities, my employees, my customers, pollution. Yes, but let's remember why we exist. We exist as an organization to make our customers' lives better and solve their problems, or else everything else falls apart. How does a company manage to stay focused when they have more than one customer? So let's take, for instance, the New York Times, which has advertisers as one customer, that's the revenue generating customer. And then they have a subsidized customer, like in the case of the New York Times readerships. How do they structure themselves to manage those competing needs? There's a very high standard for treatment of anyone in a community. And that is this, this golden rule notion of treating people the way you'd want a loved one treated. I think you owe that standard of excellence to everyone in the community, whether it's the, uh, the reader, the subscriber, the advertiser. And I think in that particular case, that is a, an important strategic choice. But don't, don't get confused who you're, who you're serving. I think what makes the Times inspirational and journalism in general to have a, a greater purpose is the ultimate duty to educate the ultimate reader and to make their lives better. And the instant you fall into the trap of misleading the ultimate consumer, the reader, in order to do something uh, to help out the advertiser, hiding the truth, for instance, or only stating you weaken the entire community. 
So even in those cases where you're getting most of your revenues from advertisers, I think you got to pick that final end consumer as the one who your community owes the duty, the, the ultimate duty of care toward. I like the concept of ultimate duty. I think about, for instance, uh, Uber, where Uber has two customers. They're multi-sided. They've got the, the drivers and they've got the riders. I can't remember who wrote this book recently, but it was called Cold Start. And it's a book about starting multi-sided businesses. And what he says is that there's that one side of a multi-sided business is the hard side. And that's the one that you need to invest in, at least at the beginning of the business to get it going. And in the case of Uber, it was drivers. That if they couldn't get drivers to the table, they couldn't do anything. And so they invested very heavily in the experience of drivers. I suspect that in the long run, they have to focus on riders. I mean, if you're going to prioritize. So this is an important point. Because there's the practical question of which side of a multi-sided business is hardest to get to the table. But then there's the other question, which is, what is my business for? The driver may be the hard person to get to the table, but my business is for the riders. Yeah. And this is actually pretty common. It, it's not an unusual situation. Uh, Uber is, is much like Airbnb, is much like eBay, is much like insurance, you know, Lloyd's of London has been going for, what, hundreds of years at least, where you've got a community of brokers and risk managers that have to uh, be serving one another. I think the way you solve it is to, to recognize that, you know, my broker might be my direct customer as an insurer, but if I don't help them find a way to actually serve their ultimate consumer better, and enrich their, their lives and get recognized and rewarded for it, I'm not going to be acting in the best interests of my broker. And in the case of Uber, if I can't give my drivers an opportunity to earn a good living by being differentially good at servicing and making their customers happy, then this whole thing, will un it unwinds. And be very careful about thinking that the driver is really your ultimate customer. Because if then you can just help them mislead consumers and get away with uh, tricks and traps. The, this is what so many businesses have run into over the years. If you consider all of the business practices out there, from rental cars charging you three and 400% markups to refill your gas tank, to huge late fees, whether you're rental cars or banks, to, to all the fees that you get on banking if you have minimum balances. And, it's everywhere. Hotels with, with crazy anti-consumer, you know, oh, we're going to boost your price by 10% after you've gone through the website and call it a resort fee. If you let yourself fall into that trap, you will eventually destroy the trust of the ultimate consumer. You're just ruining that. You're ruining the entire community. So yes, think like a community leader. You have to have everyone succeeding, but you exist only when that final consumer is getting their problem solved better than any other community they could join. Yeah, I like that. What else I like about it is that, is that you're not saying that it's necessarily the, the revenue-generating uh, consumer. It's the value-receiving consumer that is the, it's the most important. And where can, I guess, the love reside in a business? What I mean by that is, of course, people can love each other. But it seems to me that the system of the business can be a manifestation of love for the customer. And that there may be more places for this to manifest than in the hearts of the people in the company. Are there other places where it manifests? Policies? Processes? My work for 30 or 40 years is focused on loyalty because that is the core economic engine that makes these companies special. Because when you treat customers so they come back for more and bring their friends and refer their friends, that is the magic flywheel that generates extraordinary cash flow and prosperity. It is a sustainable fusion engine that once you get it going is truly astonishing. That's why, that's why Enterprise Rent-A-Car now dominates their industry. It's what made Apple great. Yes, it was good technologies, but if they'd use those technologies to abuse customers and 
trick them and trap them, they would be nowhere today. Amazon decided they were going to uh, love their customers. So this flywheel is the key. I used to think that you earn loyalty by being loyal, but now that's not quite right. You earn loyalty through love, only through the hell, the, the success and well-being and prosperity of uh, the object of my customer. Am I going to uh, create a, a prosperous community, a network, a, an organization? So I think love comes from leaders, and they try to make sure their employee teams embrace that idea. And when customers feel that love, that's when they behave in loyal fashions. They come back for more. They bring their friends. They give useful feedback. They protect you. And, and, and you don't need a PR, PR agency. If your customers have felt the love, they'll fight on your behalf and get on the web and take care of you. So I don't think it's appropriate for customers to love an organization. I don't even think it's possible. So it love flows in one way and starts this cycle going. And it is uh, it elevates the lives of customers, of course, but it also elevates the lives of employees because when they're taking place in a, uh, a community where they can enrich the lives they touch and get recognized and rewarded for it, that leads to the meaningful life that we're all trying to achieve. You know, so maybe employees, are, that's who's really getting the benefits of love. Because what's a better place to work than where you can go and actually make the world better through solving your customers' problems and get energized because you're recognized and rewarded as a teammate to, who's doing that? Customers don't end up with a more meaningful life necessarily. They've got their problem solved, but employees actually do have that benefit. One of the challenges here, and I know it's, it's probably in the implementation of how this gets rolled out, the trick with love in general, especially as you've defined it, is that I want for my customer good for them, that my happiness is knowing that they are happy. That's essentially the golden rule that you discuss in, in one of the chapters on winning on purpose. And I've interviewed a lot of, of people about what they want from work. And I will tell you that one of the things that people do want from work at a very, very frequently is they do want to help people and they want to make the world a better place. It's one of the most common answers I get. It's the natural answer. It's maybe in the top five that I hear. However, if I come to a company and you say to me that my job is to be selfless toward that customer, I could feel that that's a cynical ploy, which is I'm coming to work to be selfless. I'm getting paid X. You're getting paid X times 100. Am I being used? And how does an organization keep me from feeling like I'm being used? Well, I think a lot of people do speak that, those words, and, uh, and that's just crazy speak. Employees shouldn't be put in a position where they're supposed to, uh, it's not an act of charity. I don't think charity is nearly as powerful as a business, which holds people accountable for results and shares in the, the benefits. So what we found at Bain & Company and internally, we fell into the trap of uh, an employee survey that I think it had 130 questions or more. And so one of the HR team members was smart enough to say, let's, let's see if we can't skinny this down. What, what's the one question that sort of explains 80% of the variation in employee happiness. It was agreement with this statement. I feel like a valued member of a team that's winning for its customers. And um, valued means you people respect your time, the energy, the boundaries, the need for a balanced life, the compensation, all of those things. So I think the notion is if I can inspire my teams, to love customers, and then make sure I've built systems that recognize and reward them appropriately when they achieve that, that's what makes this a, uh, a wonderful proposition, not just for the customer, but for the employee. And if the employee is not only making the customers happy, but helping teams around them, that's what is the signal that they deserve to be promoted to higher positions of power and authority. That's the Bain system. Nobody trusts any of these uh, great place to work lists perfectly, but Bain's been at the top of most of those lists since, since they started. They were the best in consulting for so many years that they stopped con 
using it. And then Glassdoor has been the highest rated firm on Glassdoor for the last, you know, since it started. Why is it special? Well, one of them is we built a system and tried to make sure that the only leaders that can rise to positions of power and authority are the ones who not only show that they can deliver the goods for customers and make customers happy, but that their teams feel great about them and how they have led and created a culture, the right kind of culture that's based on the values we share. And so there's a voting process. Every six months, secret ballot, rank orders all of our leaders. It's really hard to get promoted. And by the time to make partner, I've lost how many, I don't know how many steps that is. You know, let's say it's six or seven. You just don't get people rising up through the organization who aren't the, the kind of people that build great communities and make employees' lives better. We have a um, weekly huddle, which is initiated with a, a survey. I think it's five or six questions now. That is the basis of the team discussion in the huddle each week. So rather than being guided by budgets and bonuses and, and targets, the financial stuff, the huddle focuses on, number one, are we solving our customers' problems? Are we creating value for our, customer, our clients? Number two, how likely is you'd recommend th- this team as a place to work uh, for a colleague to work, to join the team? And then our, um, we get into sustainable lifestyle. And did you have to work last weekend? So we're, it's a set of balanced things that help ensure the team is talking about problems and getting their priorities straight. So what I think so many companies have failed to do is build rigorous systems that are audit worthy. People think, oh, accounting, we have to audit that because people will sort of fudge the truth to their personal selfish advantage unless we audit. Well, frankly, all these systems need to be rigorous and audit worthy and be thoughtful about, do we need anonymity for people to speak the truth to power here? Or do we need partial anonymity? And this, you know, it's not just Bain, Airbnb thought that through. They know they're not going to get honest feedback, hosts and guests, unless there's some protections built into the system that make it okay to speak the truth. How do great companies get the signal from customers vividly back to their organization? This is one of the most uh, powerful applications of technology that people have not used yet. One of the best ways to use the net promoter system is send a survey when appropriate, very short, two or three questions. If someone gives you a 10 and then writes a comment in their own words explaining why they feel that way, make sure that it's easy for employees to elevate those and get them into bosses' hands. And today, it's not just a written comment. The most powerful thing is to get your customers to speak their feedback on a uh, FaceTime that explain, you know, so it's a two, tell us why you feel that way and how we can do better. And if you see the, the voice and the face and the expressions of that customer, and it's linked to how, are they a core customer? How long have they been with us? All the stuff you'd wanna know to know as a leader, how do I interpret this? That technology of getting customer feedback up the chain of command and prioritized, that's one of the coolest things that should be happening. Today, what you asked me what goes wrong with NPS? Well, they have the, the central marketing department send out the surveys and receive the surveys and try to close loops and have all the centralized learning. No, have the people who are touching customers uh, be the first line of, of learning so that they see what customers are saying about them. And then if it's something that deserves to be elevated, hit the button and elevate it. That's the way to build a, an effective feedback and learning system. I'm going to go build that next week. That's absolutely what needs to happen. It needs to be, you need to see where people are in, the, in their lives. You need to see them in, in context. You need to hear the, the tone of their voice. You need to hear their, their struggles and their successes and see them as whole people, not a number. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful idea. Well, and the best companies are bringing that into the boardroom so that instead of just going through the numbers, which anybody who's served on a public company, any board, 
you know, 90% of the discussion is around the accounting numbers and, and compliance. And you got to change that. If you want the most important allocators of resources and policy and proceeding, you have to bring the customer's reality into that room for them. And what better way than through verbatim comments or voice or wave files or, or videos of typical customers who are ref- maybe this is all curated by the employees and the teams who sort of vote which, which of these voices and which of these feedback our bosses have to, to hear. Right. I mean, one of the challenges with numbers in general is that they sing on a chart. They just, they're so powerful. They're so clear. They're so legible. I can imagine, for instance, gathering all of these videos and having them transcribed, which happens automatically anyway now, and then linking to the key comments, rolling them up into a big idea. And then you could go and look at all the videos where people talk about that big idea. They could say, you know what? This was fast. Well, here's 20 people talking about how fast it was. I love that. And I, you know, I used to keep this folder when I worked for Cisco Systems, and it was called Why I Worked for Cisco. And it was people talking about that I happened to capture in some way. I, usually I heard them on the radio talking about, they said, thank God for the internet because it saved my life in this way. And I used to keep it on there. And when I had a bad day, I would listen to it. And I would say, you know what? We're building the internet. And that woman in Palestine said, thank God for the internet. So I think that's a a beautiful idea. This is being done. It's just not in enough companies. I think when we did the the survey before Winning on Purpose was published, we asked uh, business leaders, what's the primary purpose? Your organization exists. Only 10% said it was to make customers' lives better. And that's shocking to me, given that that seems to be the only purpose that actually leads to sustainable success, prosperity for employees and investors. So you might say that 90% of the business world doesn't understand the, tr- the, the correct North Star for business success. Yeah, I mean, core to it, it seems to me, is the opposite side of, of love, which is selfishness which is we don't want to work for selfish people. We don't really want to be selfish people. You don't want to buy from selfish companies. you got to watch yourself. And in a lot of new regulated businesses, you're stuck there. But competitors who actually figure out this good people, good employees, and good customers, they gravitate toward pieces, play communities they're proud to be a part of and where, the, where people are treated according to this golden rule standard. So it's not long. It doesn't take long. And it took a while in the, in the rental car business, didn't it? But Enterprise Rent the Car just cleaned their clocks. And on and on, I see First Republic Bank as a bank that I see is just rocking through. Uh, you know, watch out. Yeah. The other day I was at, uh, I was at Whole Foods. And it's not really relevant to this conversation. It's just that the, the woman behind the counter, this happens at Southwest Airlines too, her eyes were alive. She wasn't going through the motions. She was involved. And I asked her, I said, how is it working here? She was behind the meat counter at, a, at the deli at Whole Foods. And she says, I love working here. I've worked here for 20 years. And she said, the pay is good. And I like the work. But what was really there was that her eyes were she was in the game. Yeah, I think you're, you're on a very important point. Financial accounting completely misses the true asset in a business, which is a energized, inspired human being. Energy is what you run out of. So how do you build a business relationship that, that inspires and energizes? The only way that works that I know of is to put people in a position where they can be proud of what they're doing in terms of serving others and and make sure they hear the standing ovations when they when they earn them. A lot of people haven't invested in those systems. The story I tell in the book about the Apple employee, the the team employee at an Apple store who got the most tens of anyone in the store, I asked her, what's it feel like? How does this net promoter change your life? She says, well Fred, I went to Quaker school. Golden rule is an important idea to me. Make your serve others well and make the world a better place. And when a when that promoter, I know that my everyone will know recognizes because we celebrate tens at the at the daily huddle. 
I know the guys in Cupertino know this. So I'm, I'm energized by that. But how do I feel when I earn a 10 from a customer? I feel like I'm living the right life. And so this bonus that doesn't show up in a salary check, but the notion that you've touched someone's life and made it better, that's what energizes people, whether you're behind the checkout counter at Trader Joe's or at the Apple store or any business. And that's at the core of this. And I just, yes, you have to pay people fairly. You have to find them ways to to a level of success that keeps them happy. But that's not the core. The core is putting them into a situation where they can live the right life. Yeah, and know that they are. And this is a design concept that's been very meaningful to me, which is the idea of a detect. And when I put the cap on this pen, it goes click. That tells me I've successfully completed the action. And there are lots of jobs where you're doing good for people, but you don't get the detect that shows you what you've done. Agreed. That's one of the powerful things Net Promoter provides in a well designed system. But there's other clicks, you know, there's other detects. In fast food, you can see the smiles on people's faces. You can see when they're coming back for more and, and bringing their friends. But in businesses where you're separated from the customer, you can't see their face, then you have to have other ways, either the, those FaceTime videos in the book, I suggest what I think more companies should be doing is creating the, uh, the equivalent of the points for, points against ratio that they have in basketball or goals for, goals against while you're on the ice in hockey. It's when you touch a customer, how often do they turn into promoters who come back for one and bring their friends? That score, which I think, at least in basketball, is sort of the most important one in figuring out how valuable a player is to the team. We need to put a lot more energy into that kind of statistic where the, the click is not just the employee hears it. They know all of their colleagues and the bosses hear it. What's earned growth rate? In order to fix the problem of, empl- of leaders obsessing on the net promoter score, the survey-based score, inappropriately. You know, I've, I preach, stop that, but they just won't do it because scores are really cool things and it's just too tempting to hold people accountable to a score. I recognized that we have to have an accounting statistic, not based on surveys, but based on real behaviors and financial sort of auditable behaviors. I went back to one of the earliest companies that I had studied, uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Andy Taylor, the the CEO at the time who built it into the Leviathan that it is, he says, Fred, the only way to build a, a, a profitable business, sustainable business, is to treat customers so that they come back for more and bring their friends. And I went off and did a survey thing. I wish I'd thought about, you know what? What you really need to do is track Of all of your revenue growth, how much is coming from customers? The existing customers repeat purchase, net of defections, so so net revenue retention, plus their referrals. And so earned growth is just that simple idea. We have to keep track of that magic flywheel and not just learn from it, but eventually report it. Because I think earned growth is the quality growth. It's the sustainable growth. That's the best indicator of the future of this company that the investor could have and a prospective employee could have. My dream is that earned growth will be as widely accepted as uh, in 10 or 20 years as Net Promoter has become. But there's a long way to go. There's subtle questions. How do you measure that? There are nuances. Every industry, every type of business is going to have to come up with. What about that customer who actually came in in, in February, but then defected by June? Do we keep them in the earned growth statistic or not? But once you get it, that's the metric of success, I think, is the best audit-worthy, accounting, rigorous number that businesses should be uh, should really hold, being held accountable to. Yeah. One of the things I write about is that the origin of the word customer comes from the word custom or habit back in 1409 when it was coined. And what it captures so elegantly is the idea that you are creating a habit in a person of frequenting your business. And 
also known as loyalty. I mean, it's very, very close, right? I mean, the, the trick is, though, habits are somehow more fragile to me than loyalty, which has gone beyond habit into, you know what, you could fail once or twice, I'd still come back to you because you've proven to me, you know, 10 times that you're awesome, that you're remarkable. That you live by the right principles, that you fix your problems. And yeah, you got a problem, but I know you're going to fix it. Right. What's the relationship between earned growth rate and value extraction versus value maxim maximization? Now, we should probably define value extraction. Yeah, well, that's what, that's what accounting measures really well. It measures how much money you have pulled out of your customer's wallet. That is the problem with using profits as purpose. It leads you toward thinking that as long as you don't break the law, you want to pick your customer's pockets as, as effectively as you can and use digital techniques and artificial intelligence to do it, that's great. And that just leads to a dystopia that nobody wants to live in. It's horrible. The notion of value creation means I have done something that's worth more than I'm charging for it. And if I want to maximize the value left in my customers' pockets and take the absolute minimum required to build a great business and keep my employees happy, my investors happy, it's a better world. Problem is, one problem is, we don't have ways of measuring how much value we're creating. The cool thing about earned growth is when customers come back for more and refer their friends, that's the detect, that's the signal. You have left money on the table. A car dealer would think you were stupid because you left money on the table because you, they, there's excess value there that, that customers want to sh their friends to experience. And the more you focus on earned growth as your objective, the more you maximize making the world better and leaving as much value on the table as you can afford to. And I predict that it will lead toward a much better life where we have a lot fewer screw-ups where bad profits work just fine as long as they're legal. You know, an airline that charges a $500 change fee when the true cost to the system was 50 bucks, that's bad. That's evil. That doesn't raise your employees to a higher level of existence and make them proud. It, it's horrible. And, and when you force your employees into picking their customers' pockets scientifically, you're diminishing their lives. We've all experienced that business, like, a, like the hotel where you go, and you thought it was one price. You get there, they charge you for parking. And then they charge you for water. And they charge you. It's like this slow motion mugging. And of course, you're unhappy about it. You know, the Greeks had, I've never been able to find this again, but I once read that the, that the Greeks had definitions of levels of friendship, that there were friends of bronze, friends of silver, and friends of gold. And friends of gold were, friends of bronze was, it's a quid pro quo, which is, you're my friend because you give me something, I give you something, it's entirely exchange-based. But friends of gold are people who want good for you for your own sake. and. That slow motion mugging is absolutely the, the friend of bronze model. Or worse. <laughs> I think the notion that you just steal whatever you can get away with. And that, by the way, is how many voters today think about business. It's greed and self-interest. You got to follow the law, but the, you know, who makes the laws? The legislatures have been paid off by business uh, lobbyists. So game is tilted in toward the favor of, of big businesses abusing customers. That, of course, is ridiculous. The companies who have grown to be market leaders who have made their shareholders rich, they've had the highest net promoter score in every industry we've looked at so far. So the guys who are winning in business are not winning by playing that cheating game or abusive game. They are loving customers. But because it's not measured and reported in a way that is comparable and reliable yet, everyone makes up their own truth. And people are confused about what's a good business. Is it one that makes a lot of profits? Well, not if it's at the expense of employees and customers. But does accounting make it clear? No, accounting can't tell the difference. What is the role of the finance department? What does a great finance department look like in this model? Well, I think the most sophisticated ones step back to the notion of 
promoters, customers who come back for more and refer their friends, those are the building blocks of cash flow that, that bring in far more cash than required to service them and pay all of our employees handsomely. So we want to understand the net present value of a, of a promoter, and then we need to help our teams recognize that and invest intelligently to create lots of promoters. And they make it clear that detractors are, they suck up cash. And so it's, you know, it's not just being nice to make sure that you fix, you don't have detractors. Those are destroying the health of the community. So this, although this starts as a moral philosophy, I think the smart CFOs are the ones who turn it into a cash rational economic strategy that reinforces the moral philosophy. And most businesses haven't done that very well yet. For instance, in earned growth, you got to know whether a new customer is a bought customer that you had advertising or Salesforce pitches, or someone who's coming in because a, a happy customer referred them. And I only know a handful of companies that can do that. It's something that important. I've, most companies can't tell you their net revenue retention rate. How much of your uh, growth is coming from your existing last year's book of business? Sorry, I'd have to do a custom study to do that. Sorry. Now, Amazon knows that, but most companies don't. Yeah, one of the things I respect about this in general, it's recognizing businesses as a more complex system with feedback loops in a larger ecosystem. Because the revenue extraction model is everything is a one-time transaction. And it does not recognize that those one-time transactions are going to cause a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. It's a much more sophisticated understanding of the, of the system of business in a larger ecosystem. Yes, the feedback loops really need work. That's why I mentioned the, the weekly huddles at Bain. That's what earned growth and net promoter provides from customers. But today, we, we over-rely on accounting because we know how to measure it scientifically. It's just drifted. The relevance has drifted away from without us recognizing it. What's the role of the HR department in a great business? That's a great question. I think they certainly run the, the Bain huddle system. They run the voting for which leaders deserve to be considered for further promotion. They gather feedback from employees in a way that makes it clear that the most valuable feedback is about what's constraining you from delighting customers and living the right life, as opposed to selfishly what's going to make me happy as an employee. I have not run across a lot of places outside of Bain that I think of as really, and they get this, that they are enlightened. I see some brilliant ideas, like Amazon has this drip, one question at the beginning of the day for all employees. You answer it when you boot up your computer. I see it in the Bain huddles, but I haven't seen breakthrough work that, I, that I'd hoped to in, in many places yet. My argument is that one of the big things that HR departments should be doing that they're not today is enhancing the allocation of work to people based upon where their greatest passions are. Well, it's this energy thing, right? It, you got to get people, they have to be a valued member of a team that's winning for its customers. And so they do need skills, and but they have to earn. You know, you can't make somebody valued by their teammates. They have to earn that. But yeah, I, I do think this notion of coaching them and getting into those roles should be a value, a central role for HR. And you spoke a lot in the book about the Apple stores. And so an example there would be there are people who love to be behind the, the tech troubleshooting desk, and they just love that. And then there's people who love to be out on the floor talking to customers. and showing grandparents how to see their grandkids or something. There's these different places where people get that reward. Not everybody wants to help all the same people. That's one thing that I've found in my research is that, and I've been trying to figure it out for a long time, why those who want to help people don't want to help everybody. And the truth is, different people like to help different people. Oh, I agree. Some people like to teach special ed, and some people like to teach gifted. 
That's the truth of the universe. Get the right teachers in the right places. It, right. And one of the things I realized reading your book is that oftentimes we love different populations differently. Like you might want to help migrant children more than you want to help people who are in rehabs. Yeah, or, or senior citizens. Well, a great example is the role I have at Bain is pretty unusual. They let me write books and give talks and be a Bain Fellow. I mean, that's because the philosophy is get people into niches, you know, as long as they're making the community stronger and contributing, be flexible to help them find the, 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 the role that, that energizes them. I really do think that's brilliant. This is where I get to ask my, my traditional question, which is what do you hire your job to do for you? My goal in life is to help businesses measure success more, more effectively, more accurately, to rethink purpose and how to measure progress toward that purpose. And why is it a good place to be? Because it shares those values. It, it leverages my ability to, you know, whether I want to reach somebody in Korea or Japan or, or South America, there are partners we, who can spread that gospel more effectively than me. And so what I really rely on my job to do is to get me lots of co-conspirators and fellow travelers who are spreading this, uh, this philosophy and framework. Yeah, let's dig into that a little bit. Some people who have, who have answered that question by saying, I like to work with teams, when I ask them more deeply why, they say, to amplify myself. Yeah, amplify is a good word. And so a part of what Bain gives you is time and space to discover, to invent. And then the second thing it gives you is a way to then distribute your invention or your discovery and to amplify your contribution. Yeah, to have maximum impact. I agree completely. And then in terms of maximum impact, what's also interesting in, in what you do is that it's not helping one person at a time to tie their shoe or whatever. It's, I'm going to change how the system works at a fundamental level, ideally everywhere, because that's an incredibly leveraged uh, place to apply your invention. And I'm teaching at scale. So I have a voice that goes far beyond what I could accomplish as an individual. But, you know, Bain has made some trade-offs. They, one of the things that has launched this revolution is there are technology platforms that have enabled the NPS revolution. There are companies like Qualtrics and Medallia that have made it easy to get feedback and figured out how to get video feedback of customers in the hands of the board of directors. And, and a company called Mention Me, which I'm investing in, is a, com- a tech platform that gets referrals. It makes it easy for people to give and receive referrals in a way that you can keep track of it and, and get the economics of it. So it's letting people get into these communities and customize how they can have maximum impact with the general rule that you're living up to the core values and you're making the community stronger. I've started asking a flip side to this question. And by the way, I totally get Like, sometimes you talk to people and you say, what do you hire your job to do for you? And they say something, you're like, I don't get that. I don't understand why anybody would want to do that. I totally get where you're coming from. It's a super compelling work experience to me. How do you get your detect that shows you you've made the difference you want to make? Oh, there's a a range of them. You know, you sell books. You get invitations to give speeches. You get standing ovations at speeches occasionally. You get calls from Bain partners who want to help. help it. How do we figure out earned growth in this particular industry with this client? And I think in my case, just using these metrics like net promoter and earned growth, how many businesses are taking them seriously, reporting them to the board, that's become the center for me. Yeah, being listened to. I think for somebody with your interest, I. I did a a cube study where I went out and I looked at what everybody had in their cube to understand how they were experiencing work. This supports your general topic. It's kind of off topic of your work, but one of the most common things I find in everybody's cube recurring is thank you notes. Oh yeah, well, for sure. That 
It's very true. It's, it's why I keep telling that story of what's it feel like when you get a 10. Feels like you're living the right life. And that's true for almost everybody. So what does a good boss do? They help you earn those tens and make sure that you uh, receive them in a way that uh, is mac- you hear them and e- they're easy to share with colleagues and bosses. And then the flip side of this, what job do you hire your job to do for you question, that particular question doesn't actually get to the cost of work. It says, what's the value of work to you? But what, what does work cost you? Well, anytime you're doing something that destroys energy or it's something you don't want to do, it's got a cost. And there are definitely things in any job where it, for me, it's getting on airplanes. That is a bummer. But you just have to have so much positive that uh, net, net, it's a great overall outcome. And I think over time, the more you can, you know, I don't fly as much as I used to. (laughs) If you're thoughtful about what's sucking up energy, you can delegate that, get other people who are good at it digitize it and focus on what your real gift is. And then, you know, for every hour that's technically work, it's creating three hours of energy. And I think the people who love their careers and love their work, they've, they've found that solution. Might there be a measure that is like earned growth rate that is pointed at the workforce? The thing that, uh, the question, I think, is uh, how likely you'd recommend your your team or your company as a great place to work is not a bad one. The net promoter framework applied to the employee experience is very good. The trick is how do you get people to be honest and thoughtful so they're not signaling and gaming and, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, so I'm going to give a high score or I don't want to get in trouble. So, I'll give, you know, all these in terms of behavior, I have to think about it. I don't have a quick answer there. I believe that, uh, the amount of volunteer time and energy that people throw into the making the community and especially the customers better, and that's saying the same thing essentially because communities can't be successful unless customers are are really happy. One of them is I'll just say in terms of the, like what's the earned growth rate of the workforce. You're right; it is discretionary effort. It's something like that, and that I see you know workers as subscribers, and so. There's a little bit of of a sense of land and expand, which is people start working there. And then the question is, what does the expand look like? I don't have an answer to that yet, but it has something to do with, with I'm in it. My eyes are lit up and I can, and I'm in the game. My last question is, how can people learn more about your work? The best way, read Winning on Purpose and you'll get essentially my life's, I wrote this for my grandchildren so they could see why. I believe what I believe. And I, and I think, uh, in addition, check out LinkedIn. I, I do a monthly blog that, uh, that is my latest thinking. Bain's uh, netpromotersystem.com is another really nice online resource. And luckily, Bain has invested in building NPSX, which is a training and an education system that takes my ideas and expands on them. So there's a lot of resources for people who, who want to follow through. That's great. I really recommend to people reading Winning on Purpose. I often approach business books with a fair amount of trepidation because I'm afraid they're going to say things that I find shallow or I don't know exactly. Winning on Purpose runs deep. It runs deep because it's essentially, there's like, it's almost like a morality discussion or an ethics discussion as much as a business discussion. And I, so I really admire it as a book and I really, I enjoyed reading it. Somebody told me that uh, moral bankruptcy precedes financial bankruptcy, but I think winning on purpose is actually moral riches precede and drive financial riches. That's right. I like that. Thank you very much for coming on the show and and taking the time. Dart, it's been, been my pleasure. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. And... Share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.